Hello everyone, good evening. My name is Andrew Copson. I'm Chief Executive of Humanists UK. If you're not already a member or supporter of Humanists UK, please do uh, consider taking the opportunity of this event this evening as being the hook that signed you up. Go online and you can support all of our work, of which the provision of events like this uh, is of course a very important part. And this evening's event has um, a very, uh, a very personally interesting to me context um, of the work that has been going on for the last 18 months in our Humanist Heritage Project. And many of you uh, will be aware of the Humanist Heritage Project. And last year, we as an organisation uh, celebrated our 125th anniversary. And in order to um, celebrate that part of our celebration was a new history project, which you can find online um, uh, by Googling Humanist Heritage or by going following the link on our own web website, humanist.uk, which aimed to catalogue and investigate and explore and expose and, and excavate in many ways um, the forgotten humanist history of Britain, as well as our history as an organisation over the 125 years which we've been uh, incorporated. Now, humanist heritage uh, gave rise to so many uh, rich and interesting, diverse ideas and new themes and new topics um, that Maddie Goodall, who has been our sterling Humanist Heritage Coordinator throughout that time, and to whom I'll pass over uh, in a moment, um, has had an incredibly large number of ideas for events and outputs um, off the back of it. And this evening is, is one of those events. Before I pass you on to Maddie to introduce uh, this evening's speaker and, 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 and the specific theme, I just want to mention that Humanist Heritage is part of our wider Understanding Humanism programme, and let you know not only about the recently launched new website of resources for teachers, to support their teaching about humanism in schools and colleges and other, other settings, which you can find online, but also our two online courses for adults. Two online courses, the first, Introducing Humanism, which looks at the humanist approach, uh, beliefs, values, talks to some individual humanists, um, and goes over uh, six weeks. Uh, it's guided learning, really interesting. Everyone who takes it loves it, and it's fronted um, by Sandy Toxvig. And then Humanist Lives, which is the second course, which goes into more detail about the things that humanists do uh, as a result of their beliefs and values. So it looks at the campaigning work of humanist organisations and of individual humanists, looks at things like the provision of social services um, and the work that humanists have been doing, like in our organisation for the last century or so, and globally as well, it looks at the international humanist movement. So if, as I'm sure it will, this event inspires you to do even more online learning about humanism, humanist heritage and humanists, and please do look at those courses on our website. I'll now pass you on uh, to Maddie Goodall, who's going to chair our event this evening. She has been, she, we couldn't have hoped for a better humanist heritage coordinator than Maddie over the last uh, 18 months. Um, she's taken this project from strength to strength to strength. We're delighted to have been able to extend her time with us um, right to the end of this year as well. And I'll hand over to, to, to her capable hands for this evening's event. Thank you, Andrew, um, and thank you very much as well to SI Martin for joining us this evening. Um, I won't take up too much time because I know there's a huge amount of really fascinating history to get through. Um, so I will just briefly introduce our speaker for um, this evening. So specialising in the fields of Black British history and literature, SI Martin works with museums, archives and the education sector to bring diverse histories to wider audiences. Uh, nearly 20 years ago, he founded the 500 Years of Black London Walks in response to the low profile given to Black British historical presence on the capital streets. Um, and to this end, he's consistently encouraged and championed the provision of plaques, street names and street furniture. Um, as well as this, he's published five books of historical fiction and non-fiction for adult and teenage readers. Um, he's worked with the Black Cultural Archives, the National Maritime Museum, the V&A, Tate Britain, London Metropolitan Archives, National Port Portrait Gallery, Horniman Museum, National Archives, RAF Museum and the Wellcome Trust, um, to name just a few of um, the organisations. Um, and he provides workshops and sessions for heritage institutions, for schools, borough councils and for community groups across the country. Um, I'm so excited for um, Steve to give his talk uh, this evening and this first talk in our Humanist Heritage series. Um, and I can say uh, knowledgeably that it's going to be excellent because I have seen um, Steve talk on this subject before. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over um, to Steve um, and I will catch up with you again after the talk. Thanks very much again for coming. Well, good evening, everyone. Hoping you can still hear me. Um, do flag it up um, 
if I'm not coming over so clearly. There have been a couple of gremlins. But um, yeah, thanks very much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to watch me basically try to shoehorn what's an extraordinarily complicated uh, and fascinating set of subjects, the beliefs of Black Georgians. Now, I have to say that this covers so much ground. We're looking at um, what I'm trying to, what I'll attempt to do um, in the time we've got together is to introduce um, a spectrum of characters, very, very diverse characters from diverse origins by way of creating snapshots of various um, aspects of Black Georgian life, Black life in uh, Britain in the long 18th century. Uh, we're going to take advantage of that and um, peek into the 18 teens. And um, when I'm talking about Black Georgians, I am talking about a group of people who until very recently <clears throat> um, have been overlooked. Their presence um, hasn't really been taken seriously or studied in any way. I'm talking about the thousands of individuals of very diverse backgrounds, but who are all commonly of African origin who are living in Britain during the um, 18th and early 19th century. And coming as they did from incredibly varied backgrounds from continental Africa, from the Caribbean, uh, from North America, and of course, the forgotten segment of people who were born here and had been being born, had been born here generationally, who are always, for interesting reasons, <laughs> left out of the picture. So um, all of these people have uh, uh, varied belief systems or none. And um, I really wanted to look at the impact on them of Christianity and vice versa, how they um, affected both Christianity and to a lesser degree, um, Islam um, in these islands. What happened in this collision between uh, the big sky god religions and uh, these populations of often very isolated, um, deracinated, uprooted uh, people who found themselves surviving nine times out of 10 at the heart of empire. Remember that many of these people were working either as domestic servants or they were in fact a subclass, uh, begging on the streets, starving about the streets as the phrase went. Um, others were sailors, they were soldiers. There were some people who are actually the property of other human beings. And um, at the other end, you have some fabulously wealthy people. You have a surprisingly high number of um, business uh, people. Uh, you have families of just honest grafting trades folk, um, as well as people who are verging on the aristocratic. I tend to edge away from anything which um, sniffs of Bridgerton too much, as you'll see. Um, so yeah, without further ado, let me just uh, jump straight in. And I'll start with the first aspects of um, big sky god religions that um, Africans were laboring under that uh, first came under the purview of, uh, of um, the great and the good of these islands. And it is, of course, um, Islam. And um, we have to remember that the story of um, the impact of uh, Islam on enslaved populations um, out of the African continent is still being told, it's still being researched. Um, the reasons are pretty straightforward. Um, it was through Islam that you had um, huge libraries um, of uh, literature, which were found in the cities of uh, Mali and the trade routes of Mali. It was the presence of literacy and um, uh, which sort of in, in informed uh, the thoughts of uh, generations of Africans long before contact with uh, continental Europeans on any large scale. So again, there's just huge volumes of, um, uh, there are just huge uh, volumes of literature which are just uh, lost to us and are still being translated and interpreted and many are actually perishing um, 
in the dusts of uh, Mali and yet to be uh, catalogued. Long story short, uh, this gentleman that we're looking at on the left, um, Ayuba Suleiman Jallo, who um, his name, of course, was anglicized because no one in the 1730s could be bothered to say Ayuba Suleiman Jallo, so they called him Job Ben Solomon. Actually, they Hebraicized it, but mm, the same thing. Why not call him Job? Um, Ayuba Suleiman Jallo, he was from a family of wealthy clerics and merchants. Generationally, his family had been merchants and clerics in the Senegambia region. Those of you who are familiar with that part of the planet will immediately recognize the name Jallo. It is still um, the name of um, a high profile set of families who in the 1730s being business people, traders, clerics, <clears throat> people of letters, were also involved with um, a number of trades with the Europeans on the coast. Amongst those trades was the um, <clears throat> buying and selling of uh, other people, of human lives. Um, on one such journey down to the coast to sell a parcel of unfortunate people, a couple of, actually one handful of people, um, our man, Ayuba, finds himself uh, captured, bound, his head shaved, and he is in the uh, belly of a slave ship on his way, as it turned out, to Maryland. Again, long story short, uh, he made a number of escape attempts, um, on the last of which he found himself in jail. Uh, he started communicating with the jailkeeper's uh, enslaved individual, and um, through this common language that they had of Wolof, it transpired that Ayuba was uh, no ordinary slave, that he was someone of parts and learning, and um, that he was someone of some influence as well. He is allowed to write a letter home to his father, sort of, Daddy, get me out of this one letter. This letter, of course, had to circuit through the British Isles, and it came under the scrutiny of um, a number of eminent Arabists who demanded to um, see the writer, to meet the writer. And of course, it came under the scrutiny um, of the Royal Africa Company as well, who wanted to see Ayuba Suleiman Jello for uh, non-literary reasons. They wanted to strike deals with him. He comes to Britain. He is um, entertained here lavishly. He becomes a member of a number of gentlemen's literary soci gentlemen societies and literary societies and antiquarian societies. He's fettered, you know, the usual door opening effect that all of these um, honorifics and titles, well, still do have on a significant <laughs> proportion of this island's population. Imagine that in the 1700s, his father, I should have said, also masqueraded as um, a chief and or a prince. Um, one of the things that Ayuba did while he was here was to uh, produce uh, from memory, and of course by hand, um, three copies of the Quran. And um, I think one sold for a figure so fabulous, I'm afraid to try and recall it. Um, yeah, yes, uh, one of these copies has been sold. Uh, another still remains in this country. The end of this tale is that um, Ayuba did make it back home, but he also had a number of business contacts that he'd made while he was over here. I'd love to say that he saw the error of his ways or that perhaps his religion led him to uh, some epiphany, but no. He kept up the family businesses and communications uh, with the British and um, the business folk that he'd met over here. He ended up um, uh, living a very, as you can see, happy old, uh, dying at a very happy old age for the 18th century. But I'm bringing this up really to um, underline the fact that there's very little that's known about uh, the religious practices as far as Islam goes of uh, people of African origin, of uh, black Georgians. We know that um, there's a lot of trade with Turkey and the Levant, that I think Turkey had one of the oldest embassies um, in Haymarket. Um, but again, 
Islam has a supernaturally, if I can use that uh, term in present company, a supernaturally low profile, um, apart from the Elizabethan area, where there's talk of all these um, devilish and um, diverse and uh, devilish sects, amongst which were Mahometans. But black Mahometans, I think they, uh, we don't know much about them. It's really the impact of uh, Christianity of various stripes that um, you see the impact of the black presence. You jump here. Okay, some of you will be familiar with um, this image and this book. Um, it's the frontispiece of um, the narrative of Alauda Equiano, um, probably the highest profile, um, as it was called, slave narrative um, from the 18th century, published 1789. And I could do the whole presentation on this object alone. It's quite a piece of work. Um, Equiano was been removed from Africa as um, a child. He was 10 or 11 years old. And he was beached in Bar landed in Barbados. He was traded from person to person through a number of uh, Royal Navy officers and naval personnel. He ended up buying his freedom for 60 pounds, which was extraordinary, and settling um, here in Britain, in the belly of the beast, in the heart um, of the empire, where he published this extraordinary narrative. Um, and like most of the literature of this black literature of this period, it was uh, a, 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 a cry for common humanity. It was a cry for freedom. And um, in this narrative, Equiano's way of method of battling uh, the slave trade or attacking the slave trade is to invoke common humanity through shared belief system, of course, that being Christianity. Um, I just want you to focus on <laughs> how Equiano uh, presents himself, or rather is presented um, on the frontispiece. I mean, look at him. He's looking very, very calm, measured, composed features. Was this really um, a likeness? But he's also wearing, um, you know, clean linen, uh, nice, chunky riding coat, and um, in his right hand, he has open, of course, the Bible, open to Acts chapter 4, verse 12, which speaks of how uh, there's no other name under which there is salvation under heaven than, of course, uh, Christ. Uh, what he's basically trying to do is to reflect the image of the potential reader uh, in sepia or in blackface, to be crude. He's returning that gaze, you know, we are both... Um, brothers in Christ, even though um, my skin is black, you know, my soul can be washed in Christ's blood, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a very clever piece of PR, which is easy for someone like myself to knock and mock. But I have to concede that it actually did the job. Here is someone who was a face, um, a very common face um, in uh, 1780s London. He was all over the British Isles and Ireland talking about abolition. He was presenting himself oh, he, almost willingly to churches almost every day. If you read this book, and I do recommend you read it, um, particularly as non-believers, it's quite informative how he markets this idea of him as a man of faith, which I believe he was, because it's hard to fake it. Um, <laughs> at this level. And um, you see him uh, every other day or with every other entry um, appearing and uh, giving thanks and praise at um, St. James Piccadilly, uh, St. Martin's in the Fields, um, St. George's Bloomsbury, you know, all of the um, high-end churches in what's now London's, well, still London's West End. He was a known face. And what he was doing was literally putting a face to the horrors of slavery. And his tool was uh, that of um, common faith, 
that we are all one, which is quite bizarre, uh, <laughs> given that um, a casual uh, reading, to say nothing of a close one, but a very casual reading of both the Old and New Testaments would you know, give any neutral reader to understand that um, enslavement, um, ownership of other human beings and passing them down as property to your children is top front and center underlined, <laughs> underscored um, in bold in several uh, parts of the Old and New Testament, uh, you know, through Ephesians, St. Paul's exhorts uh, uh, slaves to obey their masters. And of course, you've got the wonderfully bloodthirsty books of um, uh, Exodus um, and uh, Deuteronomy as well, where you have specific instructions uh, by Yahweh on the um, capturing and treatment which um, foreign slaves, non-Jewish slaves merit. So all of this is quite clearly there. So what's happening is even more extraordinary because with um, Equiano, from Equ around Equiano's um, narrative, you have a huge amount of attention which um, flows in from the non-conformists, the Methodists, the Anabaptists, the Moravians, basically non C of E, uh, non Catholic Church, both of whom were massive investors in the purchase of human lives. That's for another. <laughs> that's for another day. But um, it's almost as if this is it could almost be seen, couldn't it? I would argue as a form of heresy to be so against um, holy writ. Um, or the notion of enslavement, or the realities of enslavement um, as um, propounded by the Bible. Something very, very interesting is happening here um, in terms of black lives and a majority white British thought. Um, it's a sort of small revolution, but it's sort of, there's also, of course, most specifically, a revolution in black thought being presented to majority white reader, a majority white readership for the first time. And most of these people are from, um, or have some experience of plantation societies where of course, um, expression through literature um, is either forbidden and or punishable by gruesome, cartoonish and ugly means. Okay, another writer. Um, we know a lot about this period and about the thoughts and experiences of um, some Black Georgians, fortunate Black Georgians, because again, there's this um, vast library, untouched repository of information, which um, uh, has been uh, left to us. And um, this gentleman, Ignatius Sancho, if we believe his, the story of his life, was born on a slave ship, brought over here as a child, um, I think he's two or three years old. There's no nice one nice way of saying it. Basically brought over here as a pet. And he was um, brought up in basically where Greenwich Park meets Blackheath. And um, he was this walking, talking objet d'art for a family of elderly ladies. Their next door neighbor was the Duke of Montague, Duke and Duchess of Montague at Montague House, who encouraged him to read. One thing led to another. The young man became uh, very, very well read, seemed to have spent a huge amount of time at the Montagues. In fact, he moved to the Montagues when um, he was threatened. He fled, I should say, to the Montagues when threatened with being returned um, enslaved to the Caribbean. Um, but Ignatius Sancho is fascinating because it, it, unlike a lot of the black writers of this period, he doesn't um, profess, literally profess um, his Christianity in such a blatant sort of self-protective uh, manner. Uh, he doesn't have that sort of lacquer of um, holier than thou uh, posturing at, at all. Uh, I, in fact, I find him the most, um, the easiest character to, cut, to, to uh, uh, make sense of uh, and to commune with. Uh, from this period, because he has a great sense of humor, a fantastic sense of humor. And inevitably, someone with such a great sense of humor and who's so observant um, seems to have a more aspected 
view of Christianity is expressed in this passage. For those of you who can't see the screen, I'll just uh, read it out. And this is from his uh, letters. Again, I really recommend that you uh, acquire a copy. There's no excuse not to. You can download most of these out of copy books for free off of the internet. He says in um, a letter to Jack Wingrave in 1778, I must observe that your country's conduct has been uniformly wicked on the coast of Guinea. The grand object of English navigators is money, money, money. In Africa, the poor wretched natives are rendered more miserable by the Christians' abominable traffic for slaves. I should have mentioned as well that uh, Sancho uh, became a uh, grocer, one of a surprising number of black business people, business men usually from this period. Um, he had a shop one block down from Downing Street. Um, he was very privileged um, he, because he had money from property. He received money from property that he owned, which he rented. He also had the vote. This was something which was denied the huge, you know, the vast 95 plus percent of uh, British people at this time. But um, he still felt that he wasn't really part of, uh, he wasn't accepted. He said to the English, we're all either mulish or foolish without exception. And also wrote tellingly, I am only a lodger here and hardly that. Well, uh, again, fascinating characters, um, but there are different ways uh, to catch a cat. The cat, of course, being um, uh, abolition, being the anti-slavery movement. And there are different writers with different methods. We've had Sancho, who is a sort Falstaffian, um, jolly avuncular, um, again, sort of Englishman in sepia. And um, before him, you know, we met with Equiano, who is very, very much uh, coming from a Christian evidence perspective, shared belief systems. And um, there's another way of um, dealing with this subject of um, abolition, which of course has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with economics. And the economic arguments were laid out in the thoughts and sentiments on the evil and wicked traffic of slavery. Um, which was published in 1787, you know, the first major uh, work by a black person in Britain uh, looking at this subject. And the writer Ottawa Kuguana is totally uh, grounded in economic arguments, quite brutal economic arguments, some of them. Um, but he lays out his wares here, and I'll read for those of you who can't see. If any man should buy another and compel him to his service and slavery without any agreement of that man to serve him, the enslaver is our robber. It's as much the duty of a man who's robbed in that manner to get out of the hands of his enslaver as it is for any honest community of men to get out of the hands of rogues and villains. Um, Caguano had a little dusting of Christianity, but really no pun intended, as grace notes throughout the text. Uh, basically to establish that you know, he's not a complete heathen. <laughs> you know, he, he is not a sooty pagan. Um, but he, he also uh, makes his argument in purely logical, rational economic terms that uh, Britain should abolish slavery and encourage um, industry and commerce in the Af on the African continent because as uh, people in British um, influenced territories are largely inclined towards the British anyway, there'll be an increase in income on both sides. Very straightforward argument, which had all sorts of terrible repercussions in the 19th century. Okay, what about the workers? What about the ordinary people? One of the great things about uh, some of the work that I do is um, repopulating various parts of the British Isles and uh, <clears throat> exhuming um, various people that you find in parish records, births, uh, marriages, deaths. Um, and one of the phenomena, of course, is the fact that there are just so many <laughs> people that you find. Huge numbers um, of people were either being baptized or sought to be baptized. The belief was that um, by joining a faith community uh, by becoming a member of a congregation uh, as one would then become equal under the laws of God, uh, that equality would extend to equality to 
being equal under uh, the laws of man. It didn't quite work that way. But a lot of people uh, did choose to be baptized because being baptized was a phenomenal, a phenomenon which was almost unique to the British Isles, having black people being baptized because in the uh, plantation societies that many of these individuals came from, the Church of England was, in fact, even in my, until my parents' living memory, the Church of England was the white person's church. You wouldn't be buried there and you wouldn't be welcomed there. All the more so in the 18th and early 19th century during a period of, in, of, of enslavement. Um, so what you see is something really interesting um, significant numbers of the black people who are settled here are becoming baptized, choosing to be baptized, because of course there are other advantages apart from that status that being a member of a congregation uh, gives you, that being embedded, you know, consider yourself one of us sort of sensation. There's also the fact that once you are not a stranger to the parish, then you can have access uh, to poor relief, to parish funds, another material level of support, which would not be available to strangers in the parish. Um, but here's an interesting entry um, from Holy Trinity Clapham, 1792. Those of you who live in London or South London will know this uh, church standing, the church standing on Clapham Common. And it's a baptism of one Nimbana, Henry Grenville Nimbana, an adult, an African from Sierra Leone. And um, he has been welcomed into that congregation through the act of baptism. He wasn't just um, any black person being baptized. He was, drum roll, honorifics. Yeah, yes, another black prince. Um, he was from one of the leading uh, families, I think, I believe Temne society, the Temne culture of Sierra Leone. And, um, what you're looking at is a woodcut which uh, decorated, which adorned the uh, um, front of this Christian evidence pamphlet, which was written about him and written about his life. And of course, if you know anything about Christian evidence pamphlets and black people, <coughs> this was standard issue. It described how this black prince, this untutored African, uh, full of pride and vanity and um, arrogance was brought onto the teachings of Christ and learnt humility and um, you know, all of these positive Christian virtues, supposedly. And it outlines his adventures in these islands as you know, he's taken to parliament, he gives an abolitionist speech, a very good one actually, uh, and a very unforgiving one. <laughs> he sort of like went under the radar of um, the compilers of um, this screed. Um, and what we're looking at in this image is um, one of the uh, signal events of his time in South London. It's actually on Clapham Common when he's remonstrating with a local yokel for beating this horse and um, you know, he <clears throat> offering to buy the horse to save the horse's life and the horse's dignity. All of this by way of illustrating that um, through Christian instruction, this pagan uh, has been civilized, humanized even. Um, Nimbana died uh, shortly after his return uh, to uh, Sierra Leone in, excuse me, in 1793. And the closing uh, paragraphs of this uh, pamphlet are classic Christian evidence via the lives of uh, the black converted. Uh, it's typical of the products, you know, it speaks to the reader, uh, and I'll have to paraphrase because it's quite vulgar, <laughs> that um, if uh, such a person as Nimbana can uh, learn honesty and thrift and the positive European virtues through Christ, then how much more you who have been born in a civilized land, O oh reader, and um, it gives the usual Christian threat at the end that um, um, if you don't go give yourself to Christ as Nimbana did, then this story will haunt you at the end of your days. So there's got to be some spookism just to give it some savor. Um, but yeah, 
<clears throat> a very interesting gentleman um, in very bizarre times. Right, I have to hurry now. One of the other things you see is the rise of black pastors. There is a slew of black pastors who appear during this period. Uh, one of whom is the gentleman you see rendered oddly here, the Reverend uh, John Morant. Um, in North America, while it was under British, uh, while it was under uh, the British aegis, um, you saw um, the beginnings of, I would say, Black Zionism, the idea that um, there was a particularly African way um, or Black-centered way of uh, approaching the gospel, particularly of approaching the Old Testament, of repurposing the uh, books of Exodus and Levitical uh, laws um, to the needs of uh, people of African origin who really felt that they were A, in bondage, they were removed uh, by water from their ancestral home, and that all of these, um, <clears throat> uh, all of, a lot of, the, a bulk of the um, Old Testament, in a sense, mirrored the experiences um, of um, uh, African, people who would be African Americans, and who are also black people in the Caribbean. So a lot of those uh, narratives found their way into the preaching of uh, this new slew of uh, black pastors or reverence who were incredibly mobile. They got all over the Atlantic world, um, like this gentleman, John Morant, uh, George Leal, um, Boston King, John Gia, uh, they made their way to West Africa, to uh, Nova Scotia, to the Americas. And in the case of John Morant, he was here in 1785 when uh, he was preaching briefly to the uh, Black uh, community in uh, Whitechapel at the Bazaar and yet to be fully substantiated Zion Temple. And um, let, that's when he was ordained in 1785. And we see him um, around 1790, he comes back here and he is the minister to a white congregation in uh, Islington. And that's where he died. He died in Islington. But again, we've got a version of his life, which has been, uh, as it says here, taken down from his own relations, arranged, corrected, and published, basically reduced by the Reverend Mr. Aldridge. Um, but again, a fascinating life. And like so many of these lives, for people like me who like dumb adventure stories, this is just wonderful. There's so much adventure and contrasting experiences that it's just not straightforward Christian evidence. It's good stuff in there. Um, you get a real sort of taste of life, even if, though it's been uh, diluted hugely uh, by the Reverend Aldridge. Okay. Um, yes, Phyllis Wheatley, she's known as the first black woman to be a published poet in English. And um, her poems on various subjects, religious and moral, the frontispiece of which you can see in this slide, was published in 1773 in uh, Oldgate. And here is someone, again, who was taken out of Africa um, in her youth, um, 11, 12 or so. And as you can see from uh, the writing surrounding the image, she is the Negro servant. In fact, she was the property of uh, Mr. John Wheatley of Boston, who was a lawyer. She was very bright. And by way, I'm sure as a jest, uh, John Wheatley, the Boston lawyer, encouraged her to read and to write and um, to learn uh, the classics. Uh, she must have entertained um, his learned Bostonian guests no end until Phyllis expressed a desire to be published, and that could not happen in North America. Um, so she, Phyllis, uh, accompanied members of the Wheatley family to um, London in 1773, where the poems were published. Um, I'm not sure, 
it's worth having a look at these poems because they seem to play a lot of cards strangely at the same time. Um, I think she writes beautifully when she's not writing about, about religion. <laughs> when she's not um, got her mind um, on salvation um, and the world of revealed things, uh, she writes beautifully, like her poem on imagination, uh, speaking about how it, it speaks so strongly about how her own act of self recreation through dreaming is what sustains her. You feel you get an idea of the real Phyllis there. But when she writes in other poems uh, in which the spiritual uh, surfaces, such as on being taken uh, from Africa to America, which is quite something, and it basically is an appeal to the sensibilities of the pro-slavery lobby. She speaks about um, how she's removed from the Ethiopian gloom of uh, Africa. She talks about, um, well, I mean, it famously ends with the lines, um, remember Christians, Negroes black as Cain uh, may be refined and join the angelic train. Yes, she did say, remember Christians, Negroes black as Cain may become refined and join the angelic train. So um, all of that was happening, but there's the argument that she was including um, that uh, uh, closing couplet as a sort of barb, as a poke at Christian sensibilities, who still, you know, many of which, of course, were still very, very um, keen on excluding non-white people from their congregations and their fellowships. So you know, she was exhorting them to uh, remember the black Christians or remember that you know we uh, can also be Christians. So um, it's an interesting topic, which way or which game she was playing. But um, as I say, um, I think it's interesting that she felt she had to play it at all. Right, um, I could do the whole, well, whole day, I could talk about this gentleman, Robert Wedderburn. Robert Wedderburn um, is probably my favorite person from history because here is someone who was born of one of those impure connections um, in Jamaica on a, a plantation, or basically impure connections between um, the, an owner of human lives and one of the lives that was owned. Um, Robert was brought up with the black side of his family. Therefore, he became witness to the horrors of slavery, the horrors of slavery being the title of um, the uh, extended piece of writing of that same name um, about Wedderburn's basically um, autobiography, very brief autobiography. Um, Wedderburn, being brought up on the black side of his family, um, was very, very, was politicized at a very early age. The uh, transformative event uh, was witnessing his uh, grandmother, a woman by the name of Torquay Amy, his black grandmother, being pinned out on the ground, face down, stripped to the waist, and almost flogged to death for the supposed crime of uh, casting a spell on a European's vessel in Kingston Harbor, which then supposedly sank. All of which, of course, inculcated in him very, very strongly, the uh, strong antipathies both to slavery on one hand, and the you know, uh, 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 cultures of enslavement on one hand, and to um, uh, spookism on the other, um, I'll say that. Um, and this is something which seems to inform the rest of his life one way or another. And he, I have to say he led the most uh, incredibly messy life, but you know, with extraordinary fire and vim. Long story short, he finds his way again through the Royal Navy, which is um, a rite of passage for many uh, literate Black people of this period and free black people. 
So through service in the Royal Navy, he finds his way um, here to Britain, where he um, works as a tailor off St. Martin's Lane on a street store. But he's also looking for ways to organize politically. He's still full of that anger. He's carrying the weight of that rage against the systems he has survived and has witnessed. I should have said as well that um, he was given his freedom uh, as he was his uh, father's child. Um, he was a Wedderburn of that Scottish family. Anyway, here he is um, in London, full of rage, needing to connect with political organizations and just needing to vent as well. And um, he immediately throws himself into you know, the early uh, um, 19th century political group of schools and uh, debating societies. And um, he was almost part of the Cato Street conspiracy, which I won't have time to go into, but perhaps luckily for him, he was in jail at the time, but you know, he knew uh, Francis Place, um, he knew uh, Thistlewood, uh, basically all of that body of people who were agitating against the six acts of the period, which uh, restricted um, the numbers of people who could gather in one place, uh, the sorts of things which could be published and discussed and disseminated. Um, and by way of dealing with that, by way of having a platform for himself to spread these ideas, he um, opened uh, what was, you know, what he called a sort of ch a chapel in Hopkins Street in Soho. And um, in order to do this, he bought um, himself a license to preach as a Unitarian minister. Why not? That's a way of getting a congregation, and via the congregation, you can disseminate your political ideas under the cloak of religion. Now, I'm immediately taken by him because he, he's someone who's almost unique in a lot of uh, black public-facing cultures in that he <laughs> is using religion um, in a very, very sort of underhand and cold uh, way. And um, if you read some of the things that he published, and which we will in a minute, but you read some of his writings, um, they're absolutely hilarious, but straight to the point, straight to the heart of um, systems of um, imperialism, racism, and against um, organized religious belief. Um, I mean, here he is in this image, you're, you can see here, uh, having a go uh, at uh, Francis uh, Place, who with his uh, patrician way is uh, <laughs> laying out how it shall be for the working classes. And Wedderburn is basically explaining that, you know, my mother was a slave, so I know all about immediate action, massive translation and reduction there. But um, uh, let me just jump, because I'm going to run out of time very soon jump to some of his uh, writings, because this is his greatest legacy, I think. Um, in 1817, he was publishing this periodical, The Acts Laid to the Root, or A Fatal Blow to Oppressors. And you can see it's published on uh, Tottenham Court Road. And the Reverend Robert Wedderburn was um, describing here, for those of you who have uh, jumped ahead, you know, you'll see, that this issue number three opens with the article slave stealing and murder tolerated by a British jury. And uh, you'll notice that he is writing in um, Patois, in Creole. And, you know, he's writing, top teeth, top teeth, top teeth, that England man, that white man, the Christian bok, ratif him a picnic. He go hungry, he go yum him. Oh, they got another. He tiffy my mama. He be Catholic Christian. He roast my mama in the fire for yam. Uh, basically, he's writing just in straight, you know, patois of the period, period patois, if you will. And um, what he's doing is just ex this expression of horror at seeing these Christians swarming into Africa and uh, 
taking um, family members, you know, what are they going to do with them? Are they going to roast them? Are they going to eat them? What's this all about? Look, there's another Catholic. He's going to roast my mother. What's going on? Uh, interesting, because he's using language in an interesting way. He's talking to two constituencies. On the one hand, he has got that uh, main constituency of literate Black people in the Caribbean who are receiving um, uh, uh, these periodicals. He made sure that they were disseminated to um, activists in the Caribbean. And they came under the notice of uh, the Jamaican legislature as well. They did not like it. Uh, so he's definitely sending it out to them, but he's also talking to a London-based audience, a London-based readership, most of whom are white, but who will, already by 1817, have some familiarity with aspects of black slang and uh, Creole and Patois, some parts of which have already entered the English language. That's a whole other subject, but it's very, very much, um, uh, uh, it, it just hasn't been studied enough. But I like to see the fact that uh, Wedderburn is using this language and that he's publishing so much. Um, not just the Axlade to the Root, he also published The Forlorn Hope. He had a lot of help with a lot of this, I should say as well. It wasn't all his own writing, but the minor tracts were tracts like um, A Shove for Fat-Bottomed Parsons and another one's High Heel Shoes, High Heel Shoes for Dwarves in Holiness. Uh, he could pick some titles. He also had um, uh, a number of spells in jail and um, he just came out bouncing again. Uh, he never gave up the struggle and um, had a very comical end to his life. Sad and comical end, which I won't go into, but I'm gonna end on this because I'm gonna run out of time, which is uh, one of the um, uh, posters which he would uh, paste up around the streets of London. And um, this one, um, which is advertising an event on Berwick Street, you know, Ber Berwick Street Market in London's Soho at the Hopkins Street Chapel on Monday evening, August the 16th, 1819, is, is titled Vengeance, Seek. Vengeance Awaits the Guilty. And the following question will be debated. Is it possible for the government to be extricated from the accumulating perils with which it is daily surrounding itself? Admittance, sixpence. And underneath that says, the last debate respecting a slave having the right to slay his master who refuses him his freedom was decided in favor of the slave without a dissenting voice by a numerous and enlightened assembly who exultingly expressed their desire of hearing of another sable nation freeing itself by the dagger from the base tyranny of their Christian masters. Wow, some chapel. <laughs> I might have attended that one myself had I been around at the time, but um, that's a mouthful. Um, and it's a mouthful which got in, into a lot of trouble because I, I should have mentioned that Wedderburn was mad and of course he didn't just stop there. He went on to ask the same audience if it's right for the slaves to kill their, rise up and kill their masters, isn't it therefore also right um, for the poor people of Britain to rise up and kill the Prince Regent. And of course, everyone said yes. And of course, he ended up serving um, a two year uh, jail sentence in Dorchester. And I'm gonna end it there. Um, let me just cancel. Yeah, so I'm gonna end the presentation there and just open it for any questions, uh, if you have any. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. I know there's some questions in the chat already, um, so we can certainly start there. And if anybody else has any questions as well, um, then keep them coming in using the Q&A function. Um, a couple of people did ask about links um, or a, a kind of reading list. I've put some links um, in the chat to some of the works that are uh, viewable. Um, as Steve said, uh, lots of these, well, all of these things um, are in the public domain. Um, tragically, uh, I couldn't find any links to um, some of those last bits by Wedemer that you mentioned, um, and he is 
indeed a fascinating character. So um, if anybody finds any further um, examples of those, then do share. Um, but for now, I suppose we we can kick off with some of these questions. Um, are there any from the Q&A box that particularly grab you, Steve, or should we, should I pick one? Oh, uh, yes, this one. Um, well, a couple actually. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, yeah, but uh, one from uh, Ian the Boys who asks, how well were former slaves connected into the abolitionist movement? The popular perception is that the movement was a white Christian one. Well, yeah, to I mean, the thing is, the popular perception is actually fixed, more or less now. You know, Wilberforce, the Clapham sect are seen as the great liberators, this group of um, the great and the good, who, regardless of my opinions about them as personalities, did shepherd um, the abolition bills through parliament. But it's forgotten that um, you did have, uh, particularly Equiano and uh, Kugawano, who um, were active in the Sons of Africa uh, lobby group. They were constantly pushing for abolition and they were constantly in communication with uh, Granville Sharp, and uh, the Vens, the, uh, um, uh, you know, all of those eminent characters in and around uh, Holy Trinity Clapham, uh, they were in constant conversation with them. In fact, uh, Grano, Granville Sharp, as uh, one of the leading members of the Cap Clapham sect, as well as uh, Macaulay, who had been in Sierra Leone, um, they gained a lot of their experience and their sympathies uh, towards abolition from, um, the direct uh, connection with uh, black people. So um, yeah, there's there are many, many more stories to be told, but uh, you can see just by reading their literature, by reading the books um, and their pamphlets and their opinions that um, this black presence by itself was just you know, a living testimony to the horrors of uh, slavery. Okay, there's another one from Mike Higgins, he says, a uh, tremendous history of black science and free thinking internationally. Can this be linked to wider black history in terms of challenging the impression of white hegemony and the imposition of white and other Old Testament religions? Um, yes, <laughs> theoretically, <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of uh, work, I think, to do um, about recognizing the value of unorthodox thinkers um, on you know, both black and white um, institutions and individuals um, and assemblies uh, need to make a bit a huge shift because you know we're so accustomed to this idea of, um, as one uh, writer said, of uh, blue-eyed Jesu who died to save us, um, and you know surrounding him is a host of eminent white people. Um, above all, you know, William Wilberforce. But um, it, it's very important to understand, you know, how that was they were buttressed in this work and aided in this work. And of course, there were other totally separate bits of work, which were, you know, by um, uh, uh, black thinkers. One of the great things um, is that uh, pretty much all of this stuff, in fact, is um, out of copyright and, um, it's just something which I think we should just have at hand because there are amazing uh, glimpses into um, 18th century life. You know, even if you take away all of the spookism, the, especially Ignatius Sancho's life, it's an extraordinary uh, doorway into um, just everyday life for Black people. And um, it's wonderful. Sorry, there's another correction here. Um, I mentioned that um, Nangbana um, uh, died when he returned home, but he died on the journey back. Uh, as uh, Shireen Jade says, uh, he sadly died before returning home uh, once he'd been sent to be educated. I was just going to um, say in relation to that that last point you made, because um, I thought it was really interesting uh, what you said about those kind of uh, almost alternate readings of some of the writings that they were producing. Um, so, for example, uh, that those famous lines by Phyllis Wheatley actually being read as as more like a 
um, a dig, and I've heard that that said um, before that uh, that they were um, possibly quite pointed and quite quite deliberate in in the way that they were being, and also this um, I think you called it a, a small revolution of um, of taking um, this uh, white Bible um, and transforming it into into something and I, I suppose as well being selective in in what you were taking from it so um being slightly heretical in um suggesting that uh, in spite of the bible's clear endorsement of of slavery that actually it was wrong um and so i don't that's not really a, a question but <laughs> i suppose uh, drawing on that point i think that's really um a really important like you say close reading of of that history and of those works mm. yeah, but as i said even a casual reading of the bible i mean like, are we going to start christian bashing in this one <laughs> i don't know <laughs> but uh, even a casual reading um of you know these books uh you know will give you to understand exactly where yahweh and ultimately god uh and christ and his disciples stand on these issues. You know, there are no two ways about it. And it's, it points, it's, it's just a deeper tragedy that in a situation where uh, there's literally nothing to hold on to, there's no collective memory because these individuals who are enslaved into this mass of black people who had previously been uh, from a host of African cultures and societies and histories and traditions of languages, the one point which is actually offered of solace is uh, Christianity. It is the Bible. Um, and so, you know, as they say, a drowning man will clutch at a snake. And there is this great lunge towards Christianity and the sort of blurring of identities within it. And, you know, by removing yourself, you know, you can find your salvation, you can find um, the closeness, uh, even to the people who are oppressing you. It can be universal identity, but it can also be, as I said, repurposed uh, you know, through the books of um, Exodus and the early Bible to mirror the experiences of um, enslaved Africans. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um... I don't, again, I don't know. I don't want to um, choose these questions for you if there are ones that are of particular interest. There's been a couple about, I suppose, both how widely um, available and read the the writings of these um, these people were, and also what the how far the networks uh, were. Um, you know, did they extend to people um, and black people in, uh, who were musicians who were in these other other circles um, of the time, and similarly. Um, whether the history of um, US slavery and I suppose the abolition movement there recognised the role of, of black British writers or uh, black writers in Britain. Yes, and um, this is where um, the religious uh, um, individuals or the hyper-religious individuals really come into their own and literally redeem themselves because uh, people like George Leal and Boston King and... Um, John Morant, they were incredibly mobile. They got around everywhere. And I don't want to start on this because I'm the world's biggest bore on black uh, labor in the Royal Navy. Um, these people really did get around and they experienced the Atlantic world at all points. And um, they were, what well, the term now is the, the common wind, um, this common wind, which was, towards the end of the century um, was um, spreading news about rebellions, uprisings, particularly around uh, Santo Domingo, Haiti. And um, these were things which people, black people all over the Atlantic world uh, who are switched on were in touch with. So um, particularly people, you know, like Wedderburn, he was very straightforward about his intentions of disseminating this, in, this information you know, famously saying um, that um, um, he was throwing down the gauntlet to uh, the slave owners in the Caribbean, uh, saying that uh, asking them, you know, <laughs> to um, 
uh, prepare their hounds, to prepare their hunting dogs, and to get ready uh, their weapons because those flames which had consumed Haiti, Haiti were now moving in their direction, basically the British possessions. So um, yeah, there was a lot of moving around. There was a lot of exchange of opinions. And you know, we're talking about very diverse people from quite separate origins, but having one intention, a network to answer um, someone's question who I've forgotten who it was, but yes, there, there were networks. There's loads of questions now. Um, and a request for a seminar on black labor in the Royal Navy. <laughs> Don't want me to do that. <laughs> How much time have you got? <laughs> and yes, sorry, Steve Roman. Yes, eagle-eyed uh, Steve Roman from Manchester, asking from Manchester. Uh, yes, it did happen on the same day as Pete Lou, and he did refer to it uh, sub sub no, subsequently. And I mean, as I mentioned. Um, uh, as a result of Peterloo, he uh, grew closer to um, Thistlewood's mob, who became the street conspirators, you know, all of whom are hung by the neck until dead in on the 1st of May the following year, 1820. So um, that was part, would have been part of his story, as I said, had he not been in jail at that time, because he was uh, joining up with Ings uh, Brunt Black Davidson, the black man who hung with them and uh, the others who would lose their lives. There's a question from Prudence, uh, Prudence Jones asking about um, the early Atlantic trade being justified because Africans were heathens. I would imagine so. Um, it's um, after the Bishop of London, what's the 668? That's a good question. I don't think these considerations were largely observed um, either on the plantations or um, in the uh, gathering of people um, um, on the African coast. Um, I'm not sure such delicate considerations of Africans as heathens um, would have made a difference because certainly people who were baptized uh, could have been, you know, were, were still enslaved. And, you know, they still had the uh, status of property. Um, you know, it just was not the case that, you know, um, what's the phrase? There is, there are no, there is no slave and free under uh, Christ. Um, there definitely was. And, you know, the same applied in Islam as well, where uh, uh, black African people were enslaved, whether um, as members of the faith or faithful or not. So I'm not sure that any of these are subtle points of jurisprudence and um, religious observance really had any weight at all. They must have had a little, but not. No. Okay. Oh, yeah. So if anyone wants to get in touch with me, please. Uh, can I say that? Yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah. Uh, yeah so um, I, I, I masquerade a lot on Twitter. So I'm Twitter. I'm just SI at SI Martin. So I can be contacted uh, through that uh, most directly and without having to leave the couch. Okay, were these black people agitating against slavery in England in touch with each other or were they too few and spread over too long? Um, there was a high point of uh, black political organization in um, the 17, uh, 17, late 1770s, 1780s and 90s when you did have um, a lot of the people that I've mentioned being in communication with each other, knowing each other, worshiping together, and often going around the country um, together. But um, yeah, uh, uh, actually there's a point I was trying to make, which is very important, which is just walked off the table. <laughs> but um, um, yeah, were they in contact with each other? Um, yes, they largely were. But as I was saying before, their voices uh, have been drowned uh, by, you know, those higher profile voices of uh, the Clapham sect, etc. And how big was the circle? Did they know the black musicians? I believe um, that, so this is from an anonymous attendee. <laughs> um, I believe that um, there was a lot more um, uh, communication between individuals of African origin during this period because the 
the community was smaller. I mean, there's some ridiculous figures given, particularly about London, people about 20 or 30,000, but I'd go for less than half of that. But you're still looking at a very significant visible minority um, of the population of London of the 1780s being black and or Asian. Um, and, um, you know, you can just see from some of the jail records that people would, I believe, find it their duty to visit um, other black people who were being held in jail. There were all sorts of entertainments. There was actual black culture, black society, which is something which really fascinates me. There were, to a greater degree than in London 2022, black places of, um, uh, particularly black pubs, public houses, black kens, some of which are still actually standing today where, and pulling pints in 2022. Um, so it's a lot more sophisticated than we think. And in some ways it's more sophisticated and coherent than uh, a lot of cultures today. I was going to say actually, and I, I guess it probably links to that, um, or to ask rather about the about the, the kinds of records that actually do survive, where, where you can find um, this evidence in the archives. So are there, for example, collections of letters, which are obviously a good, a good way at that point to know whether people were in communication with each other, um, depending on literacy levels. Um, and, and I suppose other, I mean, you've talked about, for example, prison records or court documents and baptism records, which are also, I know, very useful ways to, to find out where people were um, and what their lives were like at the time. Um, so where where have you kind of unearthed the, these connections well, and these presences? Church, church records are, are quite good. Church records are particularly good um, when you're digging up examples of uh, some of the black pastors and black preachers. Um, very good source is our home office records at the National Archives. When you can see the sheer amount of um, infiltration of these uh, uh, revolutionary, inverted commas, group of skills of um, the early 1800s, and particularly around Robert Wedderburn, his material uh, <laughs> is there in superabundance because of course you had spies uh, attending, sometimes severally attending the same event. So you can get um, you know, cross-referenced views of um, his um, mania. So um, it's all there. I mean, there's a lot of stuff, but as a first step, just as a way, uh, a first uh, foot in, um, I'd go to um, what we have that's been published, which is downloadable, uh, particularly Sancho's uh, letters and um, um, uh, Wedderburn's, of course, his stuff as well. But Sancho's uh, uh, letters are a great uh, step into 18th century Black life. There's a couple of questions too about the um, connections or whether there were any connections to um, things like the Chartist movement. Um, and I suppose, you know, that kind of radicalism beyond um, the kind of 1830s. Uh, have you found much, oh, much yes. evidence of that? One of the interesting things that happens here is um, the sort of handing on of the baton uh, between religiously minded or predominantly religiously minded uh, black activists. Uh, into just more straight up working class, <laughs> let's get on with it, come and have a go, ishness um, of the 1840s. I mean, you see it go bit by bit. And again, I use Wedderburn as a starting point into reason and um, running side by side, although he'll die in 1820, is William Davidson, who is, uh, or Black Davidson, um, who was uh, one of the Cato Street conspirators they were attempting to blow up the cabinet as they sat to dinner at Lord Harraby's house in Grosvenor Square. And this murder of the cabinet would be the uh, spark which would um, light revolution across the British Isles. As usual, is riddled with uh, turncoats, collabos, and deeks, and backstabbers. And um, eventually they hung. Actually, yeah, they hung and their heads were cut off and stuck on pikes. Um, but then you have what's something really interesting, which is this growing conflation, again, another thing Wedderburn did, between, and it's really clunky conflation, between the struggles of the British working poor, who are 
be moving off the land into the cities and again going into um, non-conformist rather than Church of England assemblies and their struggles are being conflated with those of um, the enslaved um, in the Caribbean and that becomes a bit of a trope and a bit of a theme and of course it's quite lame in palaces but it's still there um, this sort of universal struggle, which is symbolized by, of course, people like William Cuffey, who was one of a number of uh, black chartists. In fact, uh, William, the chartists, sorry, I should explain, being that group of uh, activists and radicals for the time who gave us that body of privileges we enjoy when or if we go to vote. Basically, one man, one vote. They weren't interested in votes for women. Um, uh, secret ballot, um, one doesn't need to own property to enter parliament or um, vote. So these privileges we take for granted they were fighting for, and William Cuffey was one of a number of black chartists. In fact, he was the leader, elected leader of the London chartists and um, the times when they wanted to disparage um, their activities, they described the chartists as the black man and his party. So, um, yeah, stuff like that. And, you know, you can see it's still a train in labor history, um, which, you know, is present today. But that's when it started. And that's when that sort of odd compact was made. I think this uh, there's another question that um, is very interesting, too. So a question from Alexander Jordan. I don't know if you can see um, that on there um, from the Shropshire Ethnic Minority Alliance. Um, he says, Wedderburn really took me in, like Malcolm talking about the chickens coming home to roost right there in the heart of the empire. Um, New York, he has the audacity to say it like it is right there in the heart of empire, London. Yeah. Uh, were England-based writers like Wedderburn circulated in the Atlantic beyond these borders? And if at the time, yes, what about in the 1960s when black power was coming up in the US civil rights movements? How recent is the exhuming? Which I think is a really interesting okay, well, way to three put it things, well. Three things, a lot of my um, history is uh, it sort of uh, stops at 1948 <laughs> so i couldn't tell you anything about uh i think you can be forgiven for <laughs> yeah <laughs> no, uh, no so i mean I, I, before 1948 and the arrival of the um empire windrush oh, i can answer questions so i can't answer your last point alexander but uh, moving backwards the answer is yes, that uh, Wedderburn in particular was circulated in the Atlantic beyond these borders. And so was Equiano, of course, because Equiano, he, uh, he, firstly, his um, narrative was a bestseller. I was trying to find uh, a more appropriate term, but um, it really was a bestseller, so much so that um, his daughter, Joanna, was um, a sought after lady of leisure um, simply from the um, proceeds of her father's writing, which were available across the Atlantic as well. He had subscribers, all sorts of subscribers, um, many individuals who owned other human lives themselves were also subscribers to um, his narrative. So you did have this diffusion of information. And of course, um, Wedderburn, top front and center, um, his material, uh, caused great consternation in the Jamaican House, um, Assembly because you know it was a uh, right, right uh, c causing the enslaved people to question their status and to rise up. So, non-Christian religion. Um, this is an interesting one. I mean, I've sought in vain. There must be. There must be something. But you know, I, I, I've sought in vain to look for signs. Sorry, this is why Abigail, Abigail Bernard or Bernard, and um, I've sought in vain to look for signs of um, traditional or African traditional religion being practiced here. Uh, I mean, that would just be fantastic if I could, but I've not seen anything uh, remotely like that. Um, I imagine there must have been something of that nature, given that there was a range of uh, black societies and entertainments. Uh, many of the entertainments and, as we say, in the 21st century, nightlife was multi-ethnic. But we do have a couple of examples where apparently whites were not allowed or there are black only. And I'm imagining in those circles that uh, African traditional cultures, uh, Af African traditional religions of some sort would have been practiced, whether it was elaborately and flamboyantly as uh, candomblé, uh, vaudou, um, those uh, belief systems which made it across the Atlantic 
to Latin Central America and Southern America? Um, I don't think so, but I can't find any evidence of it. But I, I'm not going to give up. It must be there. It must be there. Yes, Rachel Drysdale, a seminar on black slave in the Royal Navy. Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> and uh, Alex, oh, back to Shropshire with um, Alexander Jordan. Uh, what does the Black British contribution to the Black Atlantic back and forth impress you with? Um, it mostly impressed me with um, the paradox of it all, that it is here um, in London that uh, politically minded people had to come to make the biggest impact. This was the place to disseminate information. This was the place to meet like-minded people. This was the place to meet sympathetic people. And bizarrely, it was a place which extended greater freedom of uh, movement, of association and assembly, and uh, the ability to publish uh, than anywhere else um, in the Atlantic world. So, um, and this of course being the fact that the population being so small wasn't considered a threat, but those liberties for those who wanted to use them uh, could be used. And um, the, it's the centrality of uh, London in all of these affairs up until uh, the 1900s, 19-teens, Pan-Africanism, um, uh, all of these things, which I just see as a continuum from the fight against enslavement uh, from the 1780s, going to the fight toward, for workers' rights domestically, going to uh, the growth of um, Pan-Africanism really in the 1880s in this country, in London, um, with fixed organizations that have the Pan-African Conference in 1900 and all the conferences up to 1945. But as I say, after 1945, history gets boring to me. Well, we've probably uh, uh, tragically not got time for, for too much more, but I, um, uh, I see that Fernando has asked whether there are any books or papers written by our brilliant speaker which can be obtained in the UK. Um, would you like to? Um, if you hunt for them, I mean, most of them are out of uh, copyright. Oh, no, my first um, has been republished in comparable or incomparable world. That was republished by uh, Penguin last year. And uh, yes, that, um, that you can get your hands on. The others you'll have to uh, find. Great, all right. Is there, would you like to, to select maybe one, <laughs> one more question particularly to answer before we um, wrap up? Uh, Actually, we, we've got six minutes. Uh, just perversely, again, Mike Higgins, um, did the Chartists have any kind of overtly anti-racist stance? Um, not really. In fact, they were quite conflicted, as I'm sure, you know, by the nature of your question, uh, you know, uh, Mike Higgins. They were quite uh, conflicted in as much as people would attack them as um, a, a, a political group, which, um, in some sense, uh, focused um, overly on the struggles of the working poor, rather than extending that hand um, to um, the people who were enslaved and vice versa. There's often an argument thrown against, um, you know, Wilberforce, the Clapham sect, that they cared not or cared less for uh, Britain's working poor. In, in Wilberforce's case, that was actually true. <laughs> he did not like the working classes one little bit, combination acts, none of that, he wasn't having it. Um, but yeah, the argument against them was the reverse, that um, uh, they were focusing their attentions on alleviating, alleviating the struggles of uh, people who were largely out of sight and out of mind, rather than the laborers and their families huddled under arches um, at their feet. Brilliant, thank you. I know, so again, uh, um, I know, and I've just spoken to our uh, marvellous events um, manager, and I know that lots of people have asked about the possibility of links being sent and perhaps some um, some of these figures uh, mentioned. Um, and so we will try and get that together in an email so that we can send it out um, afterwards so that there's um, some places to go to, to kind of follow up on some of the people that uh, we've talked about in, or, or rather Steve's talked about in, in the talk um but thank you all so much for really very interesting questions um and thank you again um 
Steve so much for such such an interesting talk um, and lots of food for thought I I would say um, hopefully yeah certainly definitely and um, and lots more research as you say lots more exhuming of these figures and their networks and their contributions um, what I uh, will, will just mention uh, quickly is that um, we have now got our next talk of the um, heritage series um, lined up, which will be with Nan Sloan. Um, and that links actually quite well to what we've been talking about um, in this the kind of latter part with the um, the kind of later movements, including Chartism. Um, Nan Sloan is uh, particularly interested in and her book, Uncontrollable Women, um, talks particularly about the contributions of working class women um, and uh, women typically forgotten from uh, history who were um, kind of active between the French Revolution and the passing of the Reform Act in 1832. Um, and so that will be, again, another really fascinating talk and an opportunity to um, delve a bit more deeply into some of these um, very rich, very complex parts of, of history that are often um, overlooked or simplified or um, forgotten altogether. Um, so thank you very much again to everybody for coming along this evening. Um, thank you also to um, all of you for your questions. And thanks once again, um, Steve, for such an interesting talk. Um, and sorry to, <laughs> to force you to cram it all into um, such a short time. I know there is uh, a huge amount of it. So thank you. My pleasure.